that adhere to many of the principles of rewilding, which I will be discussing today. Rewilding is basically a holistic form of ecological restoration that seeks to restore an ecosystem and all of its functions while reducing human influence on it. This contrasts with more traditional forms of nature conservation that emphasize constant human intervention, usually for some economic purpose or and a reduced focus on ecosystem-wide processes. Now, before I get into telling you more about rewilding, I want to direct our attention to the climate crisis. For some reason, slides, oop, we're going too far ahead. All right, here we go. Now, as someone who has spent a lot of time studying the Earth's climate throughout history, I can tell you that much of the discourse surrounding our current climate change has been very frustrating to watch. Many projections have been way off. For example, the horrendous wildfires we've now seen in the western half of North America were projected to get this bad at around 2050. The planet has now warm, warmed about 1.3 to 1.4 degrees Celsius compared to the last 10,000 years. We are already seeing an incomprehensible number of disasters and effects. Most of the projections are simply not in line with historical reality. After all, this is not the first time in the planet's history where fossil fuel burning has led to climactic changes. The last time this happened was the formation of Pangaea 250 million years ago. The formation of the continent led to a rapid increase in volcanic activity. This led to lava beds to form, which seeped deep into the earth, igniting coal deposits and releasing vast amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The result was the worst mass extinction event in the planet's history. The oceans acidified, wiping out the majority of marine life. This acidified water made its way into the atmosphere, causing it to effectively rain vinegar on land. Over 90% of all species at the time went extinct, and it took 20 million years for biodiversity to recover. Today, we are replicating these conditions. The difference being, we are bringing this about 200 times faster than the last time. The reality is that enough carbon has been put in the atmosphere to guarantee disaster, and a policy of carbon neutrality is insufficient. We have to go carbon negative. This means we have to take more carbon out of the atmosphere than we are currently admitting. Restoration of natural areas through rewilding is a vital part of this process, as it is the only way to optimally use land to remove carbon. In this regard, many would look, more to, would look to more traditional forms of nature conservation. However, most conservation projects that have seen any positive results have been too far grounded in neoliberalism and laissez-faire economics. The most effective strategy for protecting wild areas has been to commodify them. This method of conservation has essentially boiled down to a form of modern day colonialism, where the livelihoods of people in these areas become completely dependent on wealthier tourists in the Western world and can't function without them. For ex however, while it has been successful on the small scale, there have been severe limitations. For example, during the COVID lockdowns, many people fell back into poverty given the travel restrictions, showing that despite this model proving somewhat effective on a small scale, it is not sustainable in the long term. Traditionally, conservation has also been damagingly influenced by numerous ideologies, mostly Western, with the idea that we have dominion over nature and we must act as its stewards. Personally, I find this notion rather arrogant. Life on Earth has existed for over three and a half billion years. Humans have only existed for 300,000. Since when did everything else need our guidance? Conservation also assumes that ecosystems in their current state are wild and often ignores the centuries and millennia of human impacts on a given area. <clears throat> I have spoken to the heads of forest departments in countries where they did not believe forests of certain characteristics that were, that were very effective at removing carbon were a natural part of their country's ecology, simply because forests with those characteristics were destroyed before they were born and they or their colleagues never had the opportunity to see them. This is called shifting baseline syndrome, where the memories of degradation of natural systems caused by prior generations is lost and younger generations believe they've inherited a normally functioning ecosystem. 
<clears throat> what much of traditional conservation for the most, most part ultimately does is manage and research nature in a way that is most conducive for industry and business like trophy hunting or logging. However, now in the face of a rapidly accelerating climate crisis and mass extinction event, we are finding our interference increasingly ineffective and in many cases outright harmful. <clears throat> I mean, after all, if more traditional forms of conservation were working, we wouldn't be on the verge of a mass extinction. Systems across the entire planet are breaking down and it'll only take one to totally collapse irreversibly to set the collapse of others in motion like a line of planet spanning dominoes. Take the Amazon rainforest, for example. The Amazon, as we know it today, formed many millions of years under very different climactic conditions, where rainfall patterns across South America were very different. These patterns changed over time, as they always do. And in response, to the, in response, the rainforest learned to generate its own rain. This weird green looking thing you're looking at is called a stomata. Tree leaves are covered in millions of these little pores. When a tree takes in water through its roots, it eventually transpires the water out of these pores in the form of a gas. When you have thousands of trees in a particular area, enough water vapor can be released to form rain clouds while creating negative pressure pockets that bring more water vapor into an area. Sorry, what? Enough water vapor can be released to form rain clouds while creating negative pressure pockets that bring more water vapor into the area. In the case of the Amazon, where you have trees spanning the entirety of the continent, this has led to the formation of what can only be described as a river in the sky, sustaining the entire rainforest and all who live in it. We've now cut down enough of the Amazon rainforest to disrupt this process, with many parts of the rainforest receiving less rain as a result of the deforestation. This in turn is causing them to dry up, creating conditions where fire is an inevitability. This ecosystem is in no way adapted for fire. When the fire spreads, it destroys, leading to more sections of rainforest losing rainfall, leading to more fires, ultimately creating a vicious chain reaction that threatens to collapse the Amazon rainforest into a desert. Even if we stopped all deforestation, the Amazon would likely be doomed. This is where rewilding comes in. As mentioned before, rewilding is less about managing land for a specific purpose, like grouse hunting or timber, and instead staying on focused in the big picture and letting nature lead the way. Right now, me and my team are working on developing a reforestation method that is capable of combating the Amazonian dieback. We were inspired by the Japanese botanist Akira Miyawaki who was perhaps the most talented botanist of the last century. Only now is he getting some level of recognition from Western science. What makes his and our work unique is that rather than trying to focus on planting the fastest growing or most economically useful tree species, we are planting based on what a forest would have looked like in the absence of human activity. This means hundreds of species. We reach, we raise each sapling to replicate conditions that the trees would have only encountered in old growth conditions. The hundreds of species planted densely together and the replication of shade in old growth conditions induces a response in the trees that causes growth rates of over two meters each year in each tree. The variety of species also caught, creates multiple forest layers that normally would take centuries to produce. Multiple layers of forest means multiple layers of leaves, which in turn means more surface area for stomata to release water vapor, creating more rain clouds, restoring the river in the sky. Rewilding is also not just capable of undoing the damage of fires, but it is also fantastic at preventing them. I remember seeing numerous wildfires while working in Senegal and Gambia. You often hear about how a gust of wind can quickly turn a small scale fire into a landscape wide flamethrower. And it's not something you can truly appreciate until you see it firsthand. In West Africa, I saw numerous fires and one day me and my team decided to approach one. And as you can see here, we photographed it. A 
gust of wind came in and had me and my team not had a car, we'd be much crispier people today. Going to any vegetated area of West Africa, you will almost certainly see overwhelming evidence of wildfires with the ground and even the trees themselves charred completely black. The other thing to note is that most areas in Africa with large animals are really only a step up above zoos. They're just relatively small areas that are fenced off from the rest of the world. The animals can roam within the fenced areas, but can't leave it. You can imagine my disappointment when I first realized this. But what immediately caught my attention was that within the reserve, there were no sign of fires. Excuse me. In fact, the difference between the reserve and outside the reserve was so dramatic that the areas outside the fence, the ground was completely charred up to the fence, but within the reserves, no sign of fire whatsoever. This is because herbivores are amazing at fire prevention. Wild herbivores eat insane amounts of vegetation. A single rhino can eat over 50 kilograms of vegetation in a single day. A single elephant can eat over three times that. In fact, most grazers spend the majority of their day eating. For example, a zebra spends about 19 hours a day eating. The effects this has on the landscape are dramatic, as herbivores can devour excess vegetation, dramatically reducing fuel for fires, while creating gaps in the vegetation that act as fire breaks. Even under dry conditions, healthy populations of herbivores can dramatically reduce, if not outright prevent wildfires. Much of the world is completely missing large herbivores and are beginning to experience wildfires like never before. <clears throat> Look at what's happened recently in Greece, England, and Spain. Had animals like bison and wild horses been present in large enough numbers, the impacts of the wildfires in those areas would have no doubt been far less dramatic. <clears throat> Beavers are another fantastic example of how wildlife can combat wildfires. Beavers altered the landscape in such a way that it retains water even during a drought, and the effect this can have is incredible. The only reason the areas you're looking at in these photos are green is exclusively because the beavers created groundwater retention that stopped them from burning. It's bizarre to think environmental agencies around the world are only beginning to understand the value of these animals. It wasn't that long ago that fish and wildlife in the United States were determined to remove them almost entirely from public lands. Large herbivores can also dramatically increase an area's ability to sequester carbon, not only through fire control, but also just by being big. Take elephants that live in forests. By walking through the forest, they trample and destroy a lot of vegetation. The vegetation that is destroyed is mostly composed of softer, faster growing trees. Hardwoods, which store more carbon, are spared, and the destruction of the weaker plants eliminates the competition hardwoods face, allowing them to grow much larger and take in more carbon. This can double the amount of carbon a rainforest holds. This effect is so powerful that a single acre of rainforest inhabited by elephants stores more carbon than all the trees in the 843 acre Central Park in New York City. Of course, it's not just herbivores that can have a profound effect in this respect. Predators can too. The most famous example of this is the reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone. Since the late 1800s, wolves have been missing from the vast majority of the continental US. Like elsewhere in the world, they were eradicated both as a threat to livestock and a competitor to sports, hunter, sports hunters for deer and elk. They were not even spared in protected areas like Yellowstone. When the wolves left, native vegetation was lost in record numbers. Soils eroded and invasive plant species began to overtake the native species. It wasn't until the Enda Endangered Species Act in 1976 that wolves received protection from the nationwide extermination campaign that had been raging for nearly a century at that point. The act also required that animals be restored to their former habitat wherever possible. This led to wolves being reintroduced to Yellowstone in 1996. And since then, they have transformed the entire landscape. When wolves came back, the deer and elk began to avoid areas they could easily become ambushed in. This allowed many areas to quickly regenerate their vegetation, 
sequestering more carbon. Native and migratory birds use the new vegetation as shelter and for nests, increasing the numbers of both. Beavers had more access to vegetation, creating new dams and wetlands. That in turn provided more habitat and for and increased the number of fish, reptiles, and amphibians. There was more vegetation for bison and grizzly bears, leading to larger populations of both. Wolves would also kill coyotes, which led to more eagles, hawks, and snakes to eat the rodents of the park. Yellowstone was wounded when the wolves were wiped out, and their return is quickly healing it. This highlights how predators can control prey, not through controlling their numbers directly through hunting, but rather controlling what areas they go to, and as a result, what resources they have access to. This is rewilding in action. The effect the wolves had is what's called a trophic cascade, a change in the ecosystem that produces a chain reaction that affects the entire system. While the wolves returning to Yellowstone may be the most famous example of a trophic cascade, it is far from the only one. Sharks are also involved in trophic cascades. Much like wolves, animals like tiger sharks, bull sharks, and great whites have been deliberately targeted. And as a result, over 90% of them have been eliminated from the Northern Atlantic. This has caused the number of cow nose rays to skyrocket. Cow nose rays tear apart seagrass beds in search of their prey, and their unchecked numbers have destroyed the majority of seagrass beds in the Northern Atlantic. Seagrasses, like terrestrial plants, are vital for combating climate change. In this case, seagrasses play a vital role in combating ocean acidification. They take carbon directly out of the water and replace it with oxygen, reducing the acidity of the water. Coastal areas that still regularly have sharks also still have extensive seagrass beds. As they deter large numbers of any would be seagrass bed destroyers. This makes sharks vital allies in the fight against climate collapse. This also goes to show that any pred that predator induced trophic cascades exist in every ecosystem. These cascades highlight the need for intact ecological communities and the importance of nature leading the way, as these systems are almost incomprehensible. Once again, raising the question. Who do we think we are when we believe we can guide these systems? Rewilding is also not just necessary for restoring biodiversity and combating climate change, but it is also a public health necessity. Bizarre example of this regards to the parasite schistomyasis. It can cause both cancer and anemia. It is very expensive to cure, and unless you move to a different part of the world where the parasite is not present, reinfection is an inevitability. This parasite is a freshwater worm and is transmitted to humans through contaminated drinking water. The parasite's main hosts are not humans, but rather freshwater snails. The World Health Organization considers it to be the second most socioeconomically damaging parasite just outside of malaria. Now, in 1986, Senegal constructed a dam that was intended to help promote irrigation. But what the dam also did was change the conditions of the river to cause freshwater snail populations to skyrocket. Worse yet, it blocked the migratory route of a predatory prawn species, the giant river prawn that also ate the snails. This led to schistomyasis cases to skyrocket. However, since 2015, Areas where the prawns have been reintroduced have noticed a marked cape reduction in the cases of the parasite, where egg levels present in snails dropped by 80% and egg levels in humans dropped by over 50%. Looking back at North America, since wolves and other predators have been removed, it's come to light that they held many diseases from breaking out. The most well-known of this is Lyme. Lyme is caused by a bacteria called Borrelia and is transmitted for ticks. If treated early, Lyme can be managed. However, if it isn't, it can have utterly debilitating effects that can last a lifetime. This disease spreads through ticks, biting both deer and rodents. In the last few decades, Lyme has cases have increased over tenfold in the Eastern United States, and the disease is beginning to establish itself in Europe. Urban sprawl areas like suburban develop, 
developments, removing habitats like right, removing habitats for animals like possums and rattlesnakes have allowed the disease to spread more easily. And the loss of wolves and mountain lions has enabled this further. The reintroduction, no doubt, would be an, an excellent preventative measure. Now, more traditionally inclined conservationists would have you believe that predator reintroductions are not the most effective way of handling these situations. However, a quick look at the data shows that everything hunting is supposed to reduce or stop, it simply doesn't. It's mainly touted as a way to control deer numbers. And while it's basically impossible to get a good estimate of the total deer population, every indication of their numbers goes up year after year. Deer car collisions keep going up, Lyme's cases keep going up. In fact, now in areas like Yellowstone, wolves are beginning to get shot again. And the positive impact they had in all these issues is going down. Personally, I think traditional conservation has held on to heightened. Personally, I think traditional conservation has held on to hunting so tightly, not because it's an effective way to manage ecosystems, but rather because it's a multi-billion dollar industry. People do naturally worry about predators being a danger to human life, and it's not like they don't kill people. In the last 20 years, nine people were killed by wolf packs worldwide. Also, a review from the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission found 63 deaths from 1980 to 2001 from people falling off tree stands while hunting. On average, six people are killed by sharks every year around the world. Whereas from 2000 to 2023, there were 1,130 recorded fatal hunting accidents in the United States alone. Not only is hunting completely ineffective at doing what predators do, it is far deadlier than any predator could ever hope to be. Also, between 1983 and 1996, 37 people in the United States were killed by vending machines. The way this normally happens is a drink or snack will get caught in something on its way out, the vending machine gets shaken, and well, you can figure the rest out. I think it would also come as no surprise that the vast majority of the people who died this way were men. Of course, there are other reasons why we don't have wildlife running around everywhere, other than hunting. Agriculture is a big one. However, it should be noted that our current farming system is perhaps the most primitive part of our society, and that the fundamentals have barely changed since the Neolithic. For the first time in history, urban areas can become truly food self-sufficient, with urban farming and technology like precision fermentation, vertical farming, and greenhouses. We don't need vast expanses of farmland like we once did. We can and should return that land to nature. I should also note that farming systems throughout history have succumbed to much milder forms of climate change than what we've already guaranteed. Meaning that if we wish for our civilization to survive, our agricultural systems must change to adapt for what we've already guaranteed to come down the climate pipeline. Wood can now also be made by processing the cellulose of industrial hemp, creating wood that is far stronger than most commercially available farmed woods, negating the need for deforestation. We can and must change our means of, means of production to allow the wilderness to once again flourish. Now, besides just emphasizing how wildlife really isn't that dangerous and how much of the way we go interacting with it is foolish, I really want to emphasize one thing. And that is the way, and that is that every, the way everything in nature is connected is almost incomprehensible and yet deeply intimate at the same time. As we design the economies of the future, how do we not only ensure well being for humanity, but for all life and allow the endless bounty and beauty of nature to flourish and thrive once more? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ronan. That was so interesting. Yeah, I'm seeing a little bit of, yeah, clap hands. And I'd love you to remove your, your slides so that we can see everybody again. And we can open up for some discussion, questions, engagement, because I think there's so much to dig into here. It's fascinating. There's a lot of things, I mean, the prawns, I just, yeah, I'm so, so intrigued. But let's go to some of the questions in the chat. 
And then to everybody in the audience, I would love you to just raise your hand if you're wanting to ask a question. There is a raise hand feature at the bottom of the screen. So you can just click under reactions, raise hand. Um, otherwise, yeah, let me know if you're wanting to probe or ask or comment on something that Ronan said. But we've got 30 minutes to really dig deeper into this conversation. Um, so let's go to one of the comments that we had initially from Elsie. I don't know. Yay, Elsie, you can take it away. Hi, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Ronan. This was so inspiring. Well, thank um, you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. You know, I mean, it's inspiring. It makes sense. And it just feels so um, practical. So what would it take for rewilding, as you describe it, to displace traditional conservation as the norm? When you think about the milestones, what should we be looking at as the levers for change? You know, I think that is an excellent question. And I really think it's just a matter of engaging in rewilding projects and engaging in rewilding programs. And just, they're clearly so much more effective. And I think once that, once that effectiveness keeps getting demonstrated, the more it's done, I think it's really going to have kind of more of a snowball effect where it's going to become adopted more and more and become more of the norm. Can I, can I just follow up for a second? Yeah, go you know, for it. Yeah, 20 years ago, the notion of sustainability also made a lot of sense. And look where we are. So, you know, my question is more about, and maybe this is a question for everybody here, for us as a community, what is it that will affect change in um, global policies? And, you know, you mentioned something that might be an inhibitor, which is, um, for example, the hunting industry, you know, so there's a vested interest that's economic that um, could be a block to this kind of change. So I'm just, I'm just wondering and opening the question about what would it take at a, at a policy level, a systemic level, a practice level to, to, um, to go to an approach that makes more sense. Maybe it's just an open question for us to consider. Well, one thing I would add to that is in ecology, we have a concept called regime shifts. Um, and the idea is, you know, a, a good example of this is, you know, the Sahara Desert used to be a mix of grassland and tropical forest. And there were a number of factors that turned it into the desert we see it today. And this only happened about 8,000 years ago. Um, and really what caused this dramatic shift was just only a small confluence of seemingly unrelated factors. Um, everything from just changes in the planet's orbital, like kind of precision, to pastoralists beginning to have them, their goats and herders, you know, the domestication of cattle and goats, they started uh, munching away at vegetation and that disrupted a lot of processes like we're seeing in the Amazon today. And generally you go look at ecosystems throughout history, you can see these massive systemic shifts just kind of being caused by multiple seemingly unrelated factors coming together and just, yeah, leading to this huge change. And I think in terms of the way we do do this from a policy perspective and economic perspective, I really think we really just have to keep kind of pushing. And I do believe all these factors will come together and lead to a massive shift like you see in many natural systems. Thank you. Thanks, Elsie. Yeah, that was really interesting. And I think yeah, before we get to Joe and Nick, um, if there is anyone that wants to kind of speak into that question a little bit um, or respond to what Elsie said, um, please do let me know. Um, but yeah, I think this is also the reason why we have some of these we all talks, you know, is that the, the nature of the whole point of we all is to have this whole of society approach. And I loved what you're saying that nature is so interconnected that we can't even, you know, even understand or articulate how interconnected it is. And the same with the way that we engage with the world. And this is what we need to envision within our economic system as well. And we trying to do that as we all is to bring perspectives, ideas, because it doesn't help to just, you know, look at something and not understand it. So we're really wanting to 
have more spaces of knowledge sharing. I think that's the first step, but then create spaces to connect for synergies to kind of form and for people to make smaller groups, working groups to kind of tackle these issues further. Um, you know, so the space for wheel is to bring this whole of society perspective together, but also hoping that we can have smaller groups that are focused on themes of discussion, um, working towards efforts around this. I know um, you're interested in this, Ronan. I know Beth Ulgit is interested in this. And so we have a few members that are really interested in this topic. Um, and perhaps we can create a little bit of a working group or we'll chat about this on Slack. I can see a lot of people in the comments as well, Phoebe. Um, so perhaps we do need to create a space for further engagement on this topic. Cool. So before we get to Joe, I wanted to just check in because before we had Joe, we had Lizzie. So Lizzie, I don't know if you want to share verbally, but um, I can also read your question here. It says, how can fortress conservation be avoided, I think. Rewilding yeah, is so cold. Ah, oh, there you are. Do you yeah. want to go ah, ahead? I am, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, no, just I suppose like one thing that would concern me and I think um, like I think we alluded to it as well, um, Elsie alluded to it, like I suppose the hijacking of sustainability as well um, and the hijacking of rewilding and conservation as well. Like way I remember being in, like Arissa in India like 20 years ago and there was a real problem with uh land grabs at that time but not land grabs as you you would think for uh but in the name of like conservation so um I suppose how can we like I suppose balance both sustainability and human rights um in in this as well and I I, I think I'd be really really concerned as well about um so-called kind of carbon offsetting projects as well which are almost you know often branded as rewilding but in fact they're for you know um for economic purposes so beyond kind of just the fishing and and hunting a bigger concern is our capitalist system which continues to I suppose I, I think it has you know uh, hijacked rewilding a little bit so how do we avoid that I guess I know there's not a big answer to that but thanks yeah Lizzie thank you for bringing that up I think you've raised a very important question there because really at the end of the day <clears throat> the vast majority of issues we're seeing with fairy ecosystems various ecosystems around the world are ultimately systemic. I mean, you know, the best way we could stop, um, you know, the deforestation of the Amazon right now is we could just ban exports of beef from South America. You know, that's the thing. You, you're looking at both America and China. Americans eat, like, God knows how much meat. And, you know, you also look at China. Now, China, a billion people are also trying to, like, match the meat consumption that you see within the United States. And, it, this is only happening because it's just of supply and demand economics. So I think you've really highlighted something that's very important there. And I think when we talk about a relationship with nature, and you know, I don't think I have to sell anyone on here on this, but the fact that we have an economy that's just based on endless consumption, I think is really like the single biggest problem we have in regards to all of this right now. Thanks, Ronan. So Joe, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to go to Nick because he specifically said in the chat that his um, question was related to Elsie's, just to keep on that thread, and then we'll go to you and then to Kaylee. So Nick, if you can go first. Sorry, Joe, I'll, I'll try to keep it quick. Um, my, my question is for Ronan mostly and uh, reacting to one of the case studies you had around um, trying to recreate the symptoms of or the the conditions for an old growth forest. And so I'm curious for for your take on with these rewilding projects, how much of it is just like just closing off the land for nature to do its thing versus require versus requiring targeted investment because I think that changes the discussion we're having around like, changing perspectives on conservation or or advo advocating for different types of land use, right? Like when you're trying to convince someone you want to do something like this, they're going to be asking about what's the impact, what's the cost. So kind of curious on your take of like, 
given the damage that we've already done, does there have to be active human interaction to set up the initial conditions or is it sufficient just to set the land aside? I think that is an awesome question. And that actually does directly relate to what me and my team are doing right now, because basically we're taking the research done by this Japanese botanist, Akira Miyawaki. And what Akira Miyawaki basically found is if you create those initial conditions, you can compress centuries worth of growth into as little as a decade. And I would say that at the end of the day, this is more of a direct intervention, um, initially leading to just nature then taking its course. I always describe it as jump starting an ecosystem. Um, so, I mean, I think that in certain cases like the Amazon, yeah, that initial direct intervention is going to be required, but however, moving forward, it's best to just kind of let nature take its course and let it do its thing. I mean, I really think nature is better at managing nature than any human ever will be. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I think so. And it's it's interesting because you started the conversation sort of talking about human arrogance and, and the role that we play in these ecosystems. And clearly you're talking about sort of a handoff of you have to put a cer certain amount of activation energy into the system to push it back into the state that you want it to be. But at some point that there has to be a handoff where nature takes the rein, so to speak, again. And how that process happens, I think, probably affects a lot of these questions that people are bringing up of like, how do you deal with indigenous communities or people who are interacting with land? With the land? Do they have relationships that are old enough that they have co-evolved with these systems. So I'd be um, curious to learn more about how your team thinks about that sort of transition process and and kind of like the whole cost of ownership for a pro project like this to go from the initial conditions to the steady state. I think that is quite interesting. And for me, like I said, the whole idea is basically just trying to get things back to a place where they were before you know we started going in and exploiting these various systems. Um, in terms of just the kind of relationship between human and nature, I didn't think there'd be enough time to really get into it. But generally, I don't even really think there is a dualism between human humanity and nature. You know, we're part of this planet. We evolved on it. I mean, that would be like describing the universe as a separate entity. You know, it's like I'm made out of the universe's atoms. I am not separate from it. We're, we really aren't separate from nature. However, there has been a lot of biological sciences, traditional conservation have been formed, like I said, through a lot of more Western ideologies that have kind of like, whether it be through like, oh, God has made a special or something, or we're above nature or something. I think that has had a really toxic influence on how a lot of this science has been conducted. Um, so, I mean, that's really a kind of, I guess, more philosophically where I'm coming from. Thanks, Ronan. Just to um, speak to that quickly, Traditional conservation, what is meant by that? Because I think you keep referring to it and it was a thing in the chat. So what I mean by that is this very kind of, like I said, this, this, these forms of conservation and our relationship with the rest of the world that have been formed by more of these kinds of European ideologies. Um, you know, like I said, that we're separate from nature, that we're above it, that we're a special organism, you know, that we're the smartest, most powerful thing that has ever emerged. But, you know, like I said, when you look at the planet's history, when you look at the fact that we have existed for only about 300,000 years, and, you know, we've only been writing stuff down for about 10,000. And then when you look at this massive three and a half billion year, just history of life on earth, we are just this tiny, very new thing. And we are not like, I don't really think we have more right to the entire earth than any other species. And like I said, this whole idea that we're separate from all these natural processes, uh, this is, I think, really what guides traditional conservation. Um, this is why, you know, you still have entire departments and, you know, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that still think hunting is a more effective way of dealing with um, deer populations than wolves. Thank you. So Joe's hand has been up. Phoebe, I hope that kind of speaks to your question as well, but we can come back to you if it hasn't. But let's go to Joe, then to Kaylee for her comment. Great, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you, Ronan, wonderful presentation. And I'd like to just to comment first 
Uh, there are about seven pockets of grizzly bears in the U.S., Northwest, and Southern Canada, but they're in, not connected. And one of the one of the key dangers appears to be uh, genetic uh, lack of diversity because they can't connect to each other through occupied spaces and the like. As I as I was listening to you, I couldn't help but think of Ed Wilson's uh, concept of half Earth. Do you think we that half Earth half Earth makes sense? And if so, is there some way we could? Uh, what would be your ideas about how we could cause it to happen? How could cause it to come about? I love that question. Um, so, if anyone's not familiar, there was an uh, entomologist named Ed Wilson who wrote a book called Half Earth, and the whole concept behind the book is that we should really manage everything in a way that we leave half of the land in the world for nature. Um, and right now, whether it be agricultural land, urban sprawl, whatever, you know, the vast majority of that land is not being used for some natural purpose. Um, and I absolutely believe that his vision is achievable and I do believe uh, we can do better. Uh, I think one component to this would be um, vertical farming. You know, I've been inside vertical farms that were about three acres worth of land uh, compressed into a shipping container. Like they literally just repurposed the shipping container into a hydroponics facility that could make three acres worth of food in just a year. Um, so I think we could save a lot of land using that technology. I think if more people went vegan and we reduced the need for meat, that would save up a lot of land because you know most of the cropland we're using is not even for um, crops for ourselves, but rather the food we're giving our food. So I think there's absolutely a number of um, steps we could take. And I absolutely think there needs to be a lot of investment in a lot of newer kind of agricultural technologies because the amount of space we could save for nature is absolutely insane. The second largest uh, producer of vegetables on the planet after the US is the Netherlands, which is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, and see, our, oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, you go first, Ronan. Right. I thought you were... <laughs> our whole food system doesn't really make sense, anyways. I remember there was this image that went somewhat viral, and it was a tin of pears. You mentioning uh, the Netherlands reminded me of this because the tin of pears was being sold in the Netherlands, and they grew the pears in Argentina, packaged them in Taiwan, and then shipped them over to Europe. And that I think is really a perfect encapsulation of sort of this crazy tangled global mess of a food system we've created. And it's going to really require some serious um, kind of rethinking. Thank you. I can see Phoebe's also made some comments uh, relating to that in the, in the chat. So feel free to look at that as well. Kaylee, your turn. Okay, um, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, great. Perfect. I just wanted to say thank you so much for inviting me and for opening such a beautiful discussion. Um, a lot of points raised and a lot of things to take into consideration. One of the areas of focus that I've been looking a little bit into is what they call biotexture or sustainable architecture. And I know the word sustainability has kind of been just thrown around and stepped on and misinterpreted because a lot of people have been kind of using it as a way uh, to create more AI, more technology that we really don't need instead of turning their focus and attention to where it's originally intended. But I wanted to bring up that I believe that the idea of earthships, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of it or is familiar with it, should be more implemented as a way for us as a population to grow away from the centralized, um, yeah, electrical grid that really and truly is where a lot of our dependence on fossil fuels is originating from. And we're talking about decreasing CO2, but the more and more that we rely less on investor utility owned corporations and all of these power plants, sewage treatment facilities that are not only poisoning communities that they're located in, but also influencing our fresh water, um, influencing just the way that, 
yeah, our air quality, all of it. I believe like the more we grow detached, excuse me, from normalized methods of living, I feel is the way that we'll be more open to ideas like rewilding and implementing it. Our ships, sorry, let me take a step back, is a housing or a form of housing that's its own utility system, meaning that it collects its own water from rain, it treats its own sewage, it uses off-grid electricity, and is its own thermal regulating device, meaning it doesn't necessarily rely at all on the grid. The more people who start to protest, I feel, these archaic methods of electricity or how we, you know, live in this system, I feel is the way that we'll be able to really make an impact with, you know, decreasing our CO2 levels and seeing less ocean acidification, seeing less garbage, seeing, you know, less, less and less um, rather than, yeah, the baby steps that we have been taken. I'm going to stop there. I thank you, Kaylee. I think I think you raise an interesting point there, especially um, with the whole kind of regards to building materials and everything, because I think in terms of kind of creating more space for rewilding, urbanization is going to be a part of that. But the problem is right now, you know, the way a lot of buildings are constructed, whether it be, you know, steel manufacturing, concrete manufacturing, ton of carbons being released. And, you know, you mentioned recycling, recycled materials right there. That has been a key component of a lot of earth ships. I think recycled materials is really something we should be investing in, especially for urbanization. Um, we're seeing all sorts of crazy stuff people are doing with biomaterials. Like I've seen people have made like self-healing concrete, like concrete that doesn't really need to be replaced because there's dormant bacteria that have been placed inside. And when the concrete cracks, they get exposed to certain gases, which creates them, which makes them produce um, calcium as a waste product which that calcium actually goes to strengthen the actual concrete itself, which means it doesn't really need to be replaced. So I think in terms of when we're thinking about, okay, how can we create more land for rewilding? I think, you know, recycled materials, these kinds of things are absolutely crucial to be thinking about. Brilliant, thank you. Thanks, Kaylee. It was so cool to hear your voice um, and appreciated that comment. Um, we have a few in the chat. There's one by Nick. I know you're still here, Nick. I don't know if you want to um, speak to this a little bit. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll try to be quick. I don't want to monopolize the time here, but I just find no this so worries. interesting. Uh, Ronan, you've mentioned a couple of times uh, vertical farms, hydroponics, the idea of making um, human food needs more dense. And one of the things that I've often struggled when thinking about those types of solutions is they tend to be very input-based, right? Your, your nutrients or whatever you have feeds in. The actual part of the plant that gets consumed by humans isn't the whole plant. And in a farm, usually that's okay because you can recompost green manure or whatever. But in uh, in a input-based system, you have to figure out how to manage those wastes. I know technology is a big piece of what you think about and what you do. So I'd be curious what your thoughts are on how that solution gets solved and make it so that you can control the amount of input that's needed to create food in those systems. My colleague, Mark, I still see is still here. And, uh, oh, did he just leave? Mark, are you here? Oh. Mark Horler. Yes. Oh, there he is. Yeah, Mark would be far better equipped to answer that than I would. So, I mean, I'll leave it to him. Thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, it's a good question, essentially. Um, the answer lies in more complex integrations of things, in my opinion. So, you know, you could just, you could take the, plant, the parts of the plants that you don't consume and just compost them. There's no reason you couldn't do that, although it re requires a certain amount of logistics, but you might also feed plant waste to insects. You might use it as a substrate for growing mushrooms or for vermiculture or something else. The, the way that this is going to have to work ultimately I think is to create yeah more more complex integrations of things and particularly in the urban context looking at the sort of urban metabolism of how nutrients and heat and power and all of those things move around and how you can make it in such a way that the inputs of one thing are the outputs are another thing right so it's that circular economy piece of working out how to 
integrate complex systems together. And in that respect, it's not different from what Ronan is saying, you know, about ecosystems. It's ultimately biomimicry, right? Nature does this very well, and we're pretty bad at it. Um, so ultimately, if we can figure out how to do that better by doing something a bit more like how an ecosystem works, then it can have a beneficial effect. But the trade-off, obviously, I don't want to monopolize too much time here, is also that, you know, if you're if you're densifying that system and putting it in a much smaller land footprint, then ultimately, even if it is a fairly linear system, that still may be more beneficial than a more extensive agricultural system that's taking land that would otherwise be used by a complex ecosystem. I could not have put it better myself. Neither could I. <laughs> Do we have any um, other questions? I, I saw an interesting one about um, population control um, in the chat. Where, yes. Um, yeah, I can't. I can't see anymore. But someone was asking: Would population control measures um, be necessary? Um, would have to be implemented, you know, to enable larger rewilding program? And I don't think so. Um, I think really, when you look at areas like you know Africa, where you know they're really the only part of the world that's long term projected to have more of a population increase, I think what's driving that more than anything is poverty. You know, I mean, this is the thing: like people in a lot of these countries, when you introduce more like rigorous healthcare systems, when you introduce better access to medicine, there's a big correlation between them having far less children. And I think really that is the key is not necessarily implementing kind of any kind of population controls. I think that is inherently authoritarian and just not okay. Um, I really do think the solution to this is combating poverty. Thanks, Ronan. Yeah, that often can be opening up a can of worms. And I know um, it's something that, you know, some different groups are speaking into. And I know um, PB has specifically also left her details on that question as well. And I know she's one of our members and she's happy to engage on that topic as well a little bit further. But I know she's had to leave um, at this point. But I think we've got only three minutes left. So any final one minute comment that somebody wants to give that they're burning to share? Yay, I see Sanford. And I saw that you know Ronan, so it would be great to get a closing comment from you. Yeah, I've known Ronan for a few years and I've had numerous discussions with him. And I'm 77 and I saw, I know a lot of people who are bullshit artists. And like Ronan is not a bullshit artist. OK, and so like Ronan and his colleague, Mark, uh, they really know this new these new things. And, and so I'm recommending that somehow, so if you could connect Ronan and Phoebe and make sure that they have a conversation and have, have continuing discussions. Because it's only through continuing discussions can you work through the complex details of things. So you need ongoing discussions of these things. And they're experimental. And so we need to support Ronan, support Mark, and support Phoebe, and 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 continue. And thank you for we all for being here and bringing us all together. Sandy, you're going to make me blush, and I'm going to have to put Ronan is not a bullshit artist on my website. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you. And please do um, share your details, Ronan, Mark, on the chat, your website, your email addresses, so that people can get in touch with you directly as well. Um, and then I'm going to put mine. If you want to become a member of We All, I know we've got some of our members here, but it's a very diverse, open audience. Um, if you want to hear more about We All, you can email me. And I would also just want to share our next We All talk is on the 25th of September. And, oh, David is here. David, do you want to give us a 30-second ta-da to your talk um, next month? <coughs> Hi there. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, the role of health in the well-being economy and how we can understand it better, maybe uh, 
push it along a bit. But uh, yeah, I think it will be fun just to talk about that. So that's what I'm going to try and do at the end of next month. Brilliant. So yeah, if you are, you know, a member or you signed up to our newsletters, you will get information about the upcoming We All Talk um, by David. A huge, huge thank you, um, Ronan. You were really, really cool and just so insightful. I know some people will probably say, please share the slides or whatever you can share. <laughs> please do share that with me. We will be emailing everybody um, the We All Talk recording. Um, and I saw a comment to please share the chat. So we'll share that as well. And then any other information. If there's enough interest to have a further working group, you know, I can just put Ronan and Phoebe together and for them to chat further. But if there is, you know, more interest and more people email me, we can form a working group specifically around this topic as well. So I will keep you all updated. Thank you so much, everybody. It was awesome to see you and I hope to chat to you soon. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.